Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our weekly live stream webinar. Um, my name is Robin I'm from Auteach, um, and we have this week Casey Davis, aka Domestic Blisters, um, who has, you know, stolen all of our hearts with her lovely content about struggle care. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Casey. Um, and she's gonna, you know, introduce herself and do her thing, and then I'll be back for Q and A. Um, you know, make sure you put in your questions, comments um, in the uh, comment section, and we'll get to them as many as we can. Um, so I'm gonna uh, disappear, and Casey, I'll let you take over. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna get some timer up. I don't know about you guys. I am um, completely time blind. I'll talk for hours before somebody flags me down and tells me that um, I should have stopped. So I'm gonna put my little timer here. I am so glad to be here. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a licensed professional counselor and I mainly deal in the area of care tasks. And I wrote a book called How to Keep House While Drowning and that's actually going to be the topic of my talk. So I have some slides. Let me see. I'm going to pull them up for you guys. Share. I'm going to share this one with you. So if y'all Give me one second, we'll get this up and rolling. All right. So I think y'all could probably see my slides now, or at least I hope. I got a confirmation on that, perhaps. Okay, let's tell us in the thing. Not yet. So okay. I was like, oh, I think you can see it. All right, let's see. Share. Share screen. Share screen. This one. Share. Oh, I see. All right. You know what? It's trying to tell me that it doesn't want to do it. So we're going to go sans slides, if that's oh, okay. I'm good with that. You're, yeah. All right. I'll just look at them here. Okay. So... Let me open them up here so I can reference. Okay, so I have this big, huge following on TikTok and pretty much all we talk about is how to make care tasks easier and more manageable. So let's just start with what is a care task. A care task is any task required to care for self or people under your care. So things like laundry, dishes, cleaning, organizing, hygiene, movement, feeding yourself. And for a lot of people, these things are really automatic processes. And for other people, they really aren't. When you actually think about the amount of steps that it takes to feed yourself or to clean something, there are so many steps that the brain is constantly identifying, organizing, prioritizing. Your motivation systems and reward systems are having to click in at the right times. You're having to make judgments. You're having to have um, an idea of how much time something's going to take and plan for that. There really are a ton of steps there that it actually takes to do these care tasks. And for some people, like I said, it's totally automatic. And for other people, it is a struggle, whether it's a struggle from a motivational standpoint, whether it's a struggle from a system standpoint, whether they just are having so much happen in their life that they feel overwhelmed. So I have a really wide following of people, um, people with mental health issues, people with ADHD, people that are autistic, people that have chronic pain, chronic health problems, people who are going through big transitions in life like postpartum or grief and bereavement. And one of the things that's really common that can get in the way of carrying out care tasks is executive functioning issues. And executive functioning shows up in a lot of neurodivergent disorders. It shows up in ADHD, it shows up in autism spectrum disorder, and most people who study autism or love somebody with autism know about this. They know about how there are these executive functioning issues in people that have autism or are on the spectrum. And so I just wanted to sort of read you guys this really easy way of, of visualizing it. The executive functioning part of your brain is responsible for planning, staying organized, sequencing information, and self-regulating emotions. This includes impulse control, working memory, being mentally flexible, remembering goals, planning and prioritizing steps to those goals, 
um, resisting distractions and sort of swiveling from plan A to plan B when you need to. Now, what I want to challenge everyone listening, if you're if you're a parent of an autistic child or you're a teacher that works with people that have autism or you're otherwise a caregiver, you probably know, you've probably seen these issues of executive functioning in the people that you love. But what I want to challenge you today is, is that do you know one of the biggest issues, one of the biggest things that can shut down executive functioning is stress. If you are living under acute stress, if you have had chronic stress, those type of factors, when stress is in your life persistently, can shut down executive functioning. They can make it difficult for you to access those parts of your brain that do all of those tasks. And when we're under stress for long periods of time, what happens, and, and we've seen this, and let me just read this so I don't get it wrong. So there's been some studies that basically show that when you're under stress, it impairs your working memory, your cognitive flexibility, your cognitive inhibition, but it actually increases your response inhibition. So we become more reactive. And this makes sense because if you're out in the world wild picking berries from an evolutionary perspective, you don't need to be thinking about how will I sort and clean and eat these berries if a bear is chasing you, right? You need to be thinking about how do I get away from this bear right now? So when you're in a dangerous situation, evolution knows I don't need to be categorizing and sequencing and doing all these things, I just need to know run or fight. So we react quickly. But these executive functioning parts of our brain can get stuck. And as you can imagine, when I describe a care task as something that is multi-step, that takes a lot of planning, a lot of time orientation, it all of a sudden can become very difficult to carry out simple things like laundry, dishes, cleaning, grocery shopping, feeding yourself when you're under stress. And if you are caring for someone that has high needs, if you're dealing with discrimination, if you're trying to work within the medical model of your country and your systems, and you're having to go through those things every day, you're having to advocate, you're having to fight, you're having to deal with a lack of time for yourself to take care of yourself, you're having to deal with family that doesn't understand, you're probably very stressed. And that stress is probably affecting your executive functioning abilities. So in my book, How to Keep House While Drowning, there's a few principles that I talk about, and I wanted to share them with you. A lot of people, when they struggle with care tasks, the first place they go in their minds is, I'm lazy. I must be lazy. Everyone else can do this. And the reason I spent so much time talking about these issues of executive functioning under stress is because the first thing that's important to know about these care tasks, they are morally neutral. How often you do dishes, whether or not you can ever get your laundry out of the dryer, how clean your house is, None of those things have anything to do with whether you are a good or bad person, with whether you are a success or a failure. They have nothing to do with your character, with your integrity, with how hard you work, with how much you care. Being messy is not a moral failing. Having dishes piled up in your sink is not a moral failing. There is always a reason why there is a barrier to dealing with care tasks. And I have never seen it be a character flaw. I've never seen it be laziness. Frankly, I don't think laziness exists. Care tasks are morally neutral. And if you are struggling with care tasks in your home, you are not failing. There's just either a skill deficit or a support deficit or something that you need help with. You're going through a hard time. And going through a hard time is not a moral failing. So if care tasks aren't moral, and, and as silly as that sounds, it's sort of mind blowing for a lot of us because we are actually raised in a society that tells us, particularly women, that these are moral issues. That if you can't keep a perfectly immaculate house, you must be failing, you must be lazy, you must be not working hard enough. But the reality is, is that many of us are working so hard that we are really running up against some stuck points when it comes to doing care tasks. So if care tasks aren't moral, then what are they? Well, they're just functional. So we're gonna replace this idea that 
keeping a clean and tidy home and being on top of all these tasks is some kind of moral obligation, that there's this external standard of being good enough or a valid human or a good enough parent or any of those things. And we're just gonna shift over here and say, what is the function of laundry? The function of laundry is to produce clean clothes for my family to wear. So if you are doing laundry, however long it takes you, however efficient or not, if you have to run that dishwasher three times because you keep forgetting about it and mildews and then you get into the dryer and it never comes out of the dryer, you just live out of that dryer. Well, if you're doing laundry in a way that produces clean clothes, you're doing it right. That is the function of laundry. And remember, and I love this about both dishes and laundry, if you are the caregiver in your home, you signed up to make sure that your family always has clean dishes and clean clothes to wear. You didn't sign up to make sure that there was never dirty dishes and never dirty clothes. And that brings us to our second point. Care tasks are cyclical. We get into this binary thinking that things in our home are either done or not done and that the done state is morally superior to the not done state. So we feel anxious. We feel like we can't sit down. We can't rest. We're failing. When are we going to get it together? When are we going to, you know, get our shit together looking around at, at the laundry or the dishes or the, the chores that haven't been done? And in reality, care tasks are far more than a binary state of done or not done. They're really a cycle. So let's talk about the life cycle of a dish. All right. My dish and your dishes, they live in several life cycles, okay? Go back to AP bio or seventh grade where you're looking at the caterpillar and the life cycle and all the different stages, or maybe it was the tadpole that you did, but we're gonna talk about a dish, okay? A dish is not either clean or dirty. It's either um, in your cabinet put away, it is being used and eaten out of, it is dirty and being weighed, it's waiting to be cleaned, it is being cleaned and it is being it is waiting to be put away. That's like however many phases of life of that dish that I just said. I can't do mental math, so I won't pretend. Um, and the thing is, no phase of that cycle is morally superior to any other phase. It's just not. You're not failing when the dish is dirty in the sink and succeeding when it's been put away. It's all a part of a cycle of care cycles. And here's the other thing. You are not morally obligated to make all of your care cycles line up at the done state. So you might have all of your laundry put away and your dishes piled high. You might have eaten hot Cheetos for breakfast every day because you can't kind of get it together to get to the grocery store. Um, but your house is clean. That's okay. Normal people living their life and people living under stressful circumstances with high needs. Nobody is obligated to line up all these care cycles in the done state. When you are living in your home, that home exists to serve you. You don't exist to serve that home. And so when you are under stress, when you have different needs than other people, your home is going to look different. And that's okay. You're not failing at all. And so those are, those are the, that's kind of our first one. Let me look, what else I got here for you? Mm -mm. Oh, so on this idea that care tasks are functional, remember that the best way to do something is the way that it gets done. Let me share a couple of things in my home. We, we have a family closet where every single person's clothes, we have four members of our family are in the same closet. It's off the washer and dryer. We don't really fold anything. Everybody has numerous marked bins for their shirts, their tops, their underwear. And we just like a, like a, like a casino dealer on meth. We just, we just throw that stuff into the bins and we walk away. Um, and, and not everybody gets it. They think, well, clothes are supposed to be folded. Who says who? When I was stuck in this idea that my clothes, they were supposed to go from the washer to the dryer, and then I had to take them out of the dryer into a basket, then I needed to carry them to some other place in my house, and then I had to dump them out of the basket, then I had to fold them all, right? Here I am folding fleece footies like a dummy, um, fold them all. Then I had to pick them up and take them to three or four different rooms and put them away in different closets. Never mind the fact that my children are like under three and I was dressing all of them. When I realized, wait a second. And by the way, when I thought it had to be done that way, it wasn't getting done at all. It was sitting in the dryer and it was sitting in a pile of clean clothes in the laundry room. 
So when I threw out the rule book about all this has to do is function for me, it doesn't have to make sense. Um, so a question came up, the difference between a support deficit and a skill deficit. So a skill deficit is this situation would functionally improve for me if I could learn to do something better, more efficiently, or with more expertise. That would be a skill deficit, is that I could make the situation more functional if I learned some more skills. A support deficit is no matter how many more skills I learn, this situation is not going to improve because the problem here is not that I need more skills. The problem is that I need more support. Um, this is a phrase I use a lot with, with mothers that are postpartum. When they say, I'm just, I can't do it. I'm failing at this. We say, this is not a skill deficit. This is not, this would be easier if you knew more and could do better. This is a support deficit. You do not have enough help, even if you have the best family in the world. That's what that means. So when you feel like you're floundering, like you're failing, and where we go right to is this must be a skill deficit. I must just not know what I'm doing. There must be a way to do this where it will, there must be a way to do this life where I can take care of my family and get my dishes done and get my laundry done and have some sorts of cleanliness and organization. But sometimes, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes people can get help with building skills for motivation, helping building skills for systems, helping building skills for, um, you know, knowing how to clean something, time management skills. Sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes you're not lacking ability. Sometimes you just don't have the support that you would need to thrive in that situation. And sometimes a lack of support is nobody's fault. Sometimes everyone can be doing their best and there's still a support deficit. And that's a place to mourn. That's a place to grieve. That's a place also though to let yourself off the hook. It's not that you could be or should be pulling this off. This is, this is not a situation in which any one person could be pulling this off. And typically when people are in those circumstances where they feel like they're drowning, what they're talking about is feeling like they're drowning. And what often they're not talking about is every time I see my dishes, I feel shame. Every time I walk past that bedroom, that's just jam full of stuff that I can't get organized. I, it reminds me that, you know, other people must be figuring out how to succeed and I am not. That's why my channels all talk about care tasks. And, and when we talk about care tasks being morally neutral, it means the stuffed bedroom, the stuff on the floor, the backed up dishes, they are not evidences that you're not doing good enough. They aren't, they're not moral obligations. They're just functional. They exist for you to serve you so that you can live your life. And there's lots of things we can do to help you build systems around your mind, around your family, and they're going to look different from other people's systems. I have one closet. I have a dish rack that I use just for dirty dishes all day long. We just chuck those dirty dishes so that when I unload and reload my dishwasher, I'm not overwhelmed because the visual sight of my dirty dishes stacked up and organized doesn't overwhelm me like a big pile in the sink does. So we find these systems that work for us. And the other part is this recognition that you deserve kindness regardless of your level of functioning. Nobody can shame themselves into better functioning. So when we learn that care tasks are morally neutral, they have nothing to do with whether or not you're succeeding or pulling it off or being a good partner or parent or teacher or any of this, we can turn to looking at then why do I feel as though I deserve to feel this shame? Shame is the enemy of functioning. It does not help people function. And what we do is we get trapped in this external motivation of there are these external standards for how to do care tasks and there is a way of doing them and I need to do them in that way to be good enough, to be valid. But when you start to take that apart, all of a sudden you're going, okay, well, if it's not about being a good enough person or being valid or following all the rules, then what reason is there to do a care task? And the reason is because you're a person who deserves to function. They're just functional. You can do anything you need to do to make the systems in your home function, to produce what you need them to produce. So when I look at the function of picking up my downstairs, it's no longer about how I feel like if it's messy, I'm failing as a mom. It's about, okay, well, what is the function of having a clear floor? Well, I don't wanna trip on things. I like to walk around in my house barefoot without things sticking to the bottom of my feet. And I like for my kids to be able to play and they need an open space for that. Boom. All of a sudden, 
the care task of cleaning my downstairs has gone from this clean the downstairs, this big, ambiguous, never ending task that is overwhelming, which will cause us to either avoid it altogether because we're overwhelmed or go in all in obsessively and never stop and never rest because it's never done because it's a cycle. It's not done or not done. It's a cycle. So when I look at it functionally, okay, there's these three functions. I go, great. So what I can do is put all the toys away and, and organize them a little. Um, and then I can get things off the floor and then I can sweep the floor. All of a sudden it's tangible, it's finite, and I have an endpoint. And I've made my space function more for me. And that's what's important. It's about your space serving you. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, what else do we have here? Okay, one of the things also that gets unlocked once we go to a functional view of care tasks is talking about rest. So we've talked a little bit about how when we get overwhelmed and we just avoid altogether, but some people, they're, they're very caught up in the morality aspect of it that they keep going. They don't know when to stop. And the reality is that a lot of us believe that rest is a reward for productivity. And when you are caretaking, when you are caregiving, productivity, labor is not measured the same and it does not look the same. And so you could be performing labor all day and at the end, look around at your messy house and go, well, I don't deserve to sit down because look at all this. But you don't have to earn rest. Even if you didn't labor that day, rest is not a reward. Rest is a need. Rest is a right. Rest is responsible. You need to rest just like you need to sleep. Rest is not sleep. Sleep is the recharging of your brain and body that happens when you're unconscious. Rest is the recharging of your brain and body when you are conscious. And there are seasons of life, sometimes long ones, where there is more to do than there is time to do it. And if we believe that rest is a thing that happens when everything's done, it will never happen. And so we have to prioritize rest on some days, which means something's going to have to fall off the back of the truck. And, and if you think that keeping a magazine cover home is a moral obligation, you're not going to want to pick that. So you're going to prioritize those things over the resting because the resting is what lazy people do when everything's done. And I want to empower you to move rest up the priority level, move care tasks from you know, down to what is the functioning level and prioritize maybe some of the others, deprioritize some of the other stuff. In order to prioritize something good, you always have to deprioritize something good. And that's okay. And we need to embrace the imperfection. When it comes to care tasks, it's okay to start and not finish. It's okay to do a little. It's okay to do it incompletely. It's okay to do it badly. It's okay to do it and then stop. It's okay to set a timer for 15 minutes, do what you can, and then stop and walk away. It's okay to do it half ass. It's okay to do it in a way that just just makes it a little bit better than it was. All of those things are okay. And in that, when we talk about care tasks, I talk a lot about adaptive routines. So when care tasks are difficult because of mental, emotional, or environmental stressors, sometimes it means we need an adaptive routine. So we need a different way of doing things than other people. And one of the biggest places of embracing imperfection is when it comes to environmental concerns. So nobody has an issue saying that person with a disability needs to use plastic straws. But the idea that this parent or this caregiver or this teacher or this activist who is under chronic stress so much so that it does affect their functioning needs to run their dishwasher every day at 7 p.m., even when it's half full, because the routine, the consistency is allowing them to function. That is an adaptive routine. And when your job is to survive, when your job is to care for people that you love, when your job is to show up for others in a whole, healed, emotionally present way, those are hard things to do. And whatever it takes for you to be able to show up like that the best you can 
absolutely is your right to do. Use all the water, use all the pre-packaging, use all the plastic waste, use all the processed foods, none of those things. Take priority over your personal functioning. You are ethically obligated to prioritize your functioning first so that you can do good in the world. And the last thing I wanna share with you guys is this. The best way to do a care task is the way that it gets done. And that's it. <coughs> oh, pardon me for the coughs. And that's all I have. Look at that, I finished two minutes. I've never finished a talk two minutes early in my life. <laughs> You did it. Um, I, you know, obviously, you know, what you say resonates so much with, you know, what we talk about a lot at All Teach. And I just want to draw a parallel to something that I've been seeing a lot and, and talking a lot with parents about is that they're kind of what you talk about, releasing yourself from the shame, right? Or from the should, or like my refrigerator, this is how refrigerators are organized and there's no possible way to do it differently or using your space, how you want your home serving you. I see so much of that with therapy schedule, mm -hmm. um, where the purpose of therapy is to be therapeutic, um, but parents feel as if, if they are not packing every minute <laughs> of the day, um, that they are somehow failing their children and they feel mm -hmm. you know, ashamed. And so I do see so many families that are overextending themselves um, to the point where it's not serving them. Um, mm -hmm. And I have so many of the consultation calls I have are just honestly, um, no, you can quit that. <laughs> no, it's okay, you don't have to do that. Um, there's no rule that you have to do that much therapy. Um, it doesn't seem like it's helping anyone um, and allowing people to kind of, you know, make routines that work for them and not feel like they're failing their kid if they allow their child to rest. Yes. Uh, well, and not to mention that at the end of the day, what your child needs most is a parent that is full that is caring for themselves, that is able to engage emotionally. And if we've packed the schedule so full that we feel like we're just panicking, trying to get everyone everywhere and do everything right, we're actually removing one of the most important supports to our children. Yeah, it's like being present, right? If you're coming home and, and now you're overextended with all of these therapies and, and you know, well, we have to do this and the horses and the music and the, you know, the whole thing, um, then coming home and then on top of it, you know, parents are doing that third shift, um, you know, coming home and doing their care tasks after their kids are mm -hmm. in bed and everybody is missing out on rest and connection, which is actually the number one thing your child needs. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I see so many elements of what you talk about in like what we're trying to you know, relay to parents about helping their neurodivergent kids in a way that actually helps them and mm -hmm. uh, is not um, a kind of like performance of what they think they should be doing to like obtain this moral status of like, um, I'm helping my child, right? Because that looks so different. And when we start becoming so frazzled and stressed, we actually are, you know, nobody is learning under those conditions. Um, I can imagine that it would also be very difficult to, you know, if, if we're, our, we ourselves are caught up in this, like things have to be done this way with this, all of this external motivation to just fit the standard. I can see how when you're working with your neurodivergent child and you're trying to learn, okay, it's not just about behavior modification, right? It's about what's important to them. How can we connect to them? How can we allow them to use their environment in a way that serves them? I think that one of the things that can happen is that something in us goes, well, you can't do it that way. Yeah. That's not the way it's done, right? And it's, it kind of triggers in us the things that we haven't worked through of maybe we need to release ourselves from this idea that, you know, I, we have to do it a certain way. Yeah, I mean, I see that with like play a lot where, you know, neurodivergent kids will play differently and have their own unique and cool ways of playing. And I see a lot of anxiety from parents of like, that's not how you play with cars. That's not how you do that. That's not, but that's not how trains go. Like, um, and like that kind of, uh, you know, rigidity around like what, you know, that kind of idealized like should mm -hmm. 
you see it around like um, events too, you know, like there's a, always a kind of, um, you know, it's a very popular autism mommy blog is the, my child doesn't like Santa, you know, um, and, and my life is ruined because of it, because I, I, I love Santa and my, you know, my grandma loves Santa and, you know, mm -hmm. all the picture on Santa and this tradition is ruined, but like releasing themselves from that of like, maybe you don't go see Santa. Maybe you go to the train museum for mm -hmm. Christmas trains or whatever it is, right? Like embracing the fact that you can make these, these traditions, you don't serve them. Basically. Yeah. They're meant for you to enjoy your holiday and it, it makes it miserable it's actually not doing the thing it is supposed to do anyway. Yeah, and I think even neurotypical kids get a lot of messaging as children about how things should be done. And it can be really triggering to, to start to give your children permission to do things that you were shamed for or you were pressured about because, you know, especially if you succeeded at doing things the way they should have been done. Right, There's and a lot of us got our worth from that, right? Yeah. Like, I'm a good girl. <laughs> Yeah, there's this grief of, oh, that's, you know, I, I could have maybe been a more free spirited child. I could have explored more things. I could, what could have been if I had had the freedom I'm now trying to ex expend to my child? Yeah, I mean, just what you say about like, you know, releasing yourself from the shame and allowing your routines, your home, your therapy, your, you know, family outings to actually have a place in your life that enriches it and, and that you enjoy and that, you know, is functional as opposed to this kind of picture perfect, what we, you know, think we're supposed to be doing. We have so many questions, so I want to make sure we get to them. Um, I could talk all day about this. Um, could you talk about families with competing needs? Uh, we get sensory overload from different types of things. Very common question uh, around here. So I'm wondering if this is like maybe two partners with competing needs or if this is a parent and a child with competing needs, because, you know, I think we would probably handle those slightly different. I can definitely see with partners having that explicit conversation about what what is what is overloading for you, what is overstimulating for me. And when you go to do division of care, what, especially with children, like allowing that to be a part of the conversation. If it's by the time we're at the end of bedtime, I can't do it anymore. I'm I can't do it anymore. And with someone else, if it's I literally can't sit here and listen to them eat, or I can't do the whining, or I can't do the discipline, or I can't do the chaos of the zoo, I think it is perfectly appropriate to allow that to be an explicit part and a valid part of your conversations about how you're divvying up the various tasks of being a family and handling your family. Uh, and I think it models too for your kids, if they are the ones who have sensory issues, like for to model that having boundaries is okay. Mm -hmm. Like I can't sit on the side that has two people on the booth. I just can't. Yeah. <laughs> and my daughter knows it now because I say, you know, I don't want anyone touching me right now. Mm -hmm. um, but now, because we're so vocal about, I need this, I don't like this, then you start to see them doing it because you've made that like a normal part of your family culture. Um, and that might really go against the grain for some people. Some people are an ask culture in their family. Some people are a guest culture in their family, which is an interesting thing to Google sometime where, well, you know, you didn't grow up stating your needs or it was considered rude to come out and say, I don't want to sit in the back seat. I'm too hot. I get overheated and then I, I can't deal anymore. Right. It's like, Oh God. Oh, okay. So have the front seat. Like, you yes. know, talking about what are some of those sort of unspoken rules that, that you thought that are preventing that kind of clear conversation. Um, somebody asked, how do we not feel shame if people are upset with you <laughs> for not doing things the right way? Uh, not necessarily people you live with, but maybe like neighbors that you share laundry machines with or like, I don't know. Yeah. So you always want to think about the way that our, our decisions impact other people. I think there's a difference between, hey, I want to go do my laundry, but I can't because you left your laundry in the machine for, you know, eight hours versus there are plenty of machines left, but I just want to talk to you about how you really shouldn't be leaving your laundry in the machines for eight hours, right? One is a functional issue, which I think you can do what you can and you can do it without shame. Like you can, you can say, you know what? I mean, it's not a moral failing that I'm doing this thing, but it is having an impact on the functioning of somebody else. And so you just brainstorm. You just think about what are some out of the box or creative ways that I can help? Should I be setting a timer for myself? So I always go back. Should I, you know, be 
pairing that with a podcast? Should I stay in the laundry facility to do some tasks that I really enjoy? You know, I think that you just think about creative ways that you can function without kind of undoing the functioning of someone else. If it's someone who's just concerned, uh, I think you just tell them that you're not taking feedback on that. That's a lovely phrase. Um, uh, Ryan says, I am getting much needed support through a PCA, a personal care assistant. Um, any advice for the transition to someone else taking over many care tasks? It feels uncomfy or shameful to rest and watch. Um, and this is you know, a specific kind of disability question, but I think it's also a general question for anyone who has help coming um, in any way. You know, it's hard when you're uh, you know, postpartum or whatever to actually accept help um, yeah. is a common uh, feeling for people. And to me, this really, you challenge that script. Like it, is it, it's, it's specifically about someone doing care tasks in your home. They're just doing their job because what we don't do is go to a restaurant and sit in the booth and feel shame that we're not back there cooking the food, right? Like yeah. you, you could be cooking the food at home, but we don't go to a restaurant and be like, oh, I'm so lazy that I've gone to a restaurant. I'm so, you know, especially if you've had a hard day, you God, babe, let's just get takeout. It's like this great treat to yourself. And yes, yeah, somebody is cooking that food. Someone is packing that food up. Someone is driving that food to your house, but we don't have that same shame talk, right? Of I'm resting while they are cooking, which tells me that it is some sort of script about the morality of care tasks. And so I think that sometimes it's helpful to look at other types of care tasks. And am I feeling this shame everywhere or is it just here? Because that might be more related to our dialogue around care tasks or our dialogue around rest. What were we told about rest when we were younger? What were we told about productivity when we were younger? What sort of tie-ins do we have about worth and productivity and rest and sort of walking through with someone you trust or with a therapist, some of those internal messages? So true. We internalize so much of that. Um, suggestions on how to start finding ways to make something more functional when already in an overwhelmed state. Does that make sense? Absolutely makes sense. You know, the time to overhaul all of your systems is not when you feel like you're drowning. And the best thing I have for this is it's okay to just take care of tomorrow you. Tomorrow you does not need four loads of laundry. Tomorrow you needs one out. Tomorrow you does not need every dish in your sink or arsenal she needs or he needs or they need one plate, one set of silverware, one cup. Just take care of tomorrow you. Just what tomorrow you needs. And, and that's going to be doing things quickly and incomplete and just a little bit. And I think that while you're just going through that survival period, if you can just take care of even some of what tomorrow you needs, while you're gathering that support that you need around you to help you maybe take on some of the bigger tasks and ask for help with some other things. I love that. Um, when, oh, this is just people responding to the laundry thing. Um, somebody <laughs> said, your TikTok about reorganizing the fridge really helped me. I'm eating healthier because I'm seeing the healthy food instead of being hidden and forgotten. Um, I have been meaning to redo mine actually after seeing yours because I was like, that's so good. <laughs> So helpful. Um, I, really well. I really like, okay, so we talk about that a lot because, you know, there the rules of like where things go in your house, right, is like a weird script, like you said, like mm -hmm. that this has to be here and like you have to use bookshelves for books and like you have to, you know, like put things in certain places or like you said, like you have to, clothes have to go in drawers, like, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times for families, especially have, who have neurodivergent children who do things differently, have to adapt, right? And maybe can't have, you know, certain types of furniture in their child's bedroom for safety reasons, um, and then start to feel this weird kind of shame around actually making their house serve their children, <laughs> um, yeah. right? Because they feel like it's... Um, especially this is like a big discourse for um, that comes from like special education and stuff. Um, but that's not the real world, right? Um, mm -hmm. You're setting them up for failure because that's not how the world is. Um, and that's not how things are supposed to be done. And so you're, you're giving in to them or something like that, like catering to their neurodivergencies. Um, and it's a very ableist discourse, but I think a lot of parents feel that way and hold back from actually making changes that would make their homes work better for them. Yeah. I think it's a misunderstanding of like 
how we raise children in general, neurotypical or neurodivergent children, is that you're not raising adults. You're raising children. They're, <laughs> they're children now. They are supposed to have things changed for them so that they can build, you know, and if there are skills they need to learn, they will only learn those skills from a secure foundation, from a base of care, security, um, comfort. They have to have a space that works for them, that serves them so that they can learn those internal foundations of attachment and worth and motivation and on top of that you can teach skills that they will need but also like i i understand i don't know i'm a fully grown woman my house i do my house the way i want yeah but like you, people really don't think they can't like i like i was you know it's taken me a while to be like i guess i could put the yeah. in a different room but yeah. like, it still feels weird like um, Claire had a great question. Uh, I have a 12 year old neurodivergent mm -hmm. boy who has absorbed some of my eco anxiety. I've been working on using resources with less guilt, but now I'm stressing him a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, ideas for helping us balance. Yeah. So, um, there was a super interesting TikTok recently where this guy was like, the real eco flex is peeing in your sink because you, then you use the water to wash your hands and you've saved so much water. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just like the perfect example of like, where does it stop? <laughs> like there is no such thing as eco-perfectionism. First of all, the individual consumer is not the ones who have created climate change. If every individual consumer changed their habits, we would not save ourselves from climate change. It really is major corporations. It's their responsibility to find sustainable packaging. Um, you know, we do what we can, but when you put an anxiety driven perfectionism in a higher priority than your functioning as a person, that's not actually being eco-friendly. That's just having anxiety, um, right? It's like when people get orthorexia, it's like, okay, just because you're choosing the healthy foods and you're obsessing over the healthy foods doesn't mean it's not an eating disorder. So right. just because you've picked a very like healthy, good moral, subject doesn't mean it's not anxiety and i think what helps me is is to recognize that we can't do everything that's step one and then to talk about what can we do because sometimes there's something extra that you can do that you wouldn't have thought about so if you really are feeling like oh we feel so guilty about um the ease at which we order our prescriptions and get them delivered because they come in cardboard boxes then you can think about well what's something in our home we can do that will allow us to feel as though we're participating in this cause. And so maybe you think, well, you know, what if we started composting? What if we, what if we started composting? Maybe we hire a little service to come bring our compost or we do our own compost in the backyard. Just something sometimes that can make you feel not everything has to be a one-to-one -one swap, but getting involved in things that allow you to go, okay, this is, this is something we care about and that's good. So how can we get, proactively involved in this issue, not reactively anxiety driven, cutting off our needs and worrying about every cardboard box we use. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's uh, such helpful advice, especially for our um, perfectionist friends. And then also, uh, you know, with neurodivergent kids, right, seeing those gray areas are already difficult, right? Mm -hmm. And so, things become very black and white and very like good or bad. Um, and we can, you know, get kids like almost more rigid by like creating these kind of morality around things. Right. And not allowing ourselves to have, you know, some gray area. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think when you, and I, I do actually have, um, if my website is strugglecare.com and there actually is a whole page on eco perfectionism um, if, and some of that can helpful. Cause sometimes if you have a real logical kid, you can kind of go with that. So where does it end? Right? Like if you can get a little informed yourself and walk them through, so should, you know, where, where does it end? And you kind of laugh about the guy peeing in the sink and, and like, Oh, well that's obviously we can't do that. Or, you know, sometimes it can be helpful to sort of talk about, you know, there is, there is no eco perfect. It's all a spectrum. And where we choose to exist on the spectrum and the choices that we make, they have to be holistic choices um, that take into consideration our functioning as well. 
Thank you. So mm -hmm. helpful. Um, and if there's any, not any more questions, I guess we can kind of wrap it up. If you have, do you have any like closing thoughts, words of wisdom? Mm -hmm. You've shared so many helpful things uh, so far. So. I no, I think that's pretty much it. I wish I had some great profound thing to say at the end. I, I don't. <laughs> Okay. Me neither. <laughs> um, anyway, I want to thank everyone for coming and Casey really, you know, thank you for, for being here. We love your work so much. And, you know, we've been like peripherally, uh, you know, talking about similar kind of concepts around these things, but it's so nice to, to connect with you. And we really appreciate you doing this and all the work you're doing for the whole community. So you know what's uh, funny? I, I think this is the first time we've ever like we've messaged a lot, but we've never like spoke. But it doesn't um, feel that way. I know. It's like weird because there's like a couple other people that like I feel like I've like like um when I met um Cecilia, like we talk all the time on like thing, and then I met her and I was like, I felt like we were like really knew each other. Yeah. And I was like, this like is so weird, this internet, because I look like I sound like a hundred years old. Um, but like TikTok, um this new internet. It's, it's like this, you know, it's parasocial, but it's also like we actually do talk. It's just yeah. not in real life. But yeah. um now we're we now we talked in real life. So yeah. um anyway, all right, we're gonna end it here. Thanks everyone for coming and thanks, Casey, and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>